when Dr. Farid first asked me to come and speak here, first of all, can people in the back hear? Okay. When Dr. Farid first asked me to speak here, it was a couple of months ago, and he said, let's do some kind of primer on Yemen's experience so far in the Arab uprisings, and I was happy to do that. But when Tawakal Kerman was awarded the Peace Prize, I knew that I would have to talk at least a little bit about her. And I think, actually, she's a really effective lens through which we can understand not just the Arab uprisings, but the kinds of substantial changes that have taken place in the region over the past 20 years. Um, and I was going to talk historically in the original version of two, so that's, that's actually not a, a total change. So tonight, in, in particular, I said well, I'm going to talk about Tawakal Kerman as cause and effect of political change. And there are three major questions that I'll focus on. The first is, what is the significance of Tawakal Kerman's Nobel Peace Prize in terms of Yemen's ongoing revolutionary struggle? The second, which I think is really worth unpacking, is how she's interpreted by various, various subsets of the revolutionary movement, because the meaning and significance of Tawakal Kerman's activism and the Peace Prize, actually, are, are, there's a lot of variation in how people are reading that outcome. But mostly, I'm going to talk about this third question. What can her trajectory tell us about the broader shifts in Yemeni political life over the past 20 years? I have some maps. I've been told maps are useful. So here we go. The first thing to bear in mind about Yemen is that until 1990, there were two Yemens. There were two states the, in the north and the south, and they had different regimes, meaning they had, if we think of the state as uh, uh, the apparatus that monopolizes the legitimate use of force, and we think of the regime as the set of rules that distribute power within that state, there were both two states and they had two substantially different regimes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some major milestones in pre-unification history. Now, this can be a little confusing, but this is the north and this is the south, so go figure. Um, the South was colonized and administered by the British, and the North was ruled under something called a Zaidi Imamate, a form of hereditary religious monarchy uh, affiliated with the Zaidi Shi'i sect. That doesn't mean that everybody in the North was actually Shia. There was actually substantial variation, but that was their sort of regime type before unification um, and before the revolutions that established these two countries. So in 1962, there was a revolution in North Yemen that overthrew the Zaidi Imamate and established the Yemen Arab Republic. And five years later, in the south, there was a revolution that kicked out the British and it renamed the new state the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen. As you know, People's Democratic Republics tend to be Marxist, or tended, since they're mainly a historical anachronism, tended to be Marxist. So it was a Marxist revolution in the south, and a Republican revolution in the North. In 1972, so shortly after the Southern Revolution, they signed, the two countries signed the Cairo Agreement to lay the groundwork for their unification. So the idea was that post-Imamate and post-colonialism, these two countries had every intention of becoming one. But it still took a really long time for that to actually happen. Border disputes, uh, vested interests in the various militaries, etc. Um, and in fact, in the North, there was a, a pretty substantial yeah. civil war bef before which we can't really say that the Northern regime was fully consolidated. We can talk about 1978 as the point at which the Northern regime was really most clearly consolidated and President Ali Abdullah Saleh became president. So President Ali Abdullah Saleh, as you may know, still president, highly contested president. Uh, but he first became president of the North in 1978. In 1986, we start to see the crumbling of the southern regime that's going to lead to unification. Internal purges within the Yemeni Socialist Party are very destabilizing. And from a northern perspective, their southern neighbor was really at risk. And then two additional things happened. The first is that the Soviets adopted a foreign policy shift that said that satellite states that had once received substantial support no longer would. So it wasn't clear how the South was going to keep paying its bills. And the second major shift was the discovery of oil on the border. So suddenly, 
This, there's an unstable regime in the South and a massive incentive for unification from the Northern perspective. And this 1972 Cairo Agreement is no longer a thing of the past. So that's how we essentially get to the point of having a single state. This map is not very clear over here. It looks a little clearer on this one. So this is all of Yemen today, divided by governorates. The capital of Sana'a is here, kind of in the middle. I'm going to talk a bit today about the city of Faiz, which is right here. Faiz was always in the north of the, of the north-south divide, but really close to the border. So it has cultural ties to the south. Port city of Aden is down here. Okay. So in the post-unification period, we can conceive of Yemen as having what's called a competitive authoritarian regime. What does that mean? Um, the unification agreement was based on political pluralism. It enabled democratic competition between parties for legislative power, but it concentrated a lot of power at the executive level. So there was genuine competition at the kind of parliamentary level that allowed interest groups to aggregate their their interests or aggregate in pursuit of their interests. It allowed for vivid, vibrant associational life. So the kinds of things that you see today are surprising in scope, maybe, but the history of activism is long standing and was enabled by that unification constitution. Um, but executive authority has always been very concentrated. And as we'll see, the power of the executive has expanded over time at the expense of the political parties. So the first draft, uh, the, the first thing that they did after unifying was draft a new constitution for a new country called the Republic of Yemen, ROY, right? In 1993, they held the first parliamentary election, and the basic expectation had been that the former ruling party of the North and the former ruling party of the South were going to be the big winners, right? They have built-in constituencies, why not? And so it's going to be roughly proportional to North versus South population divides, et cetera. The problem was that the party that came in second was actually a brand new party, and no one had anticipated that they would come in second. And that that new party was the Islamist Islah Party, which I'm going to talk about a lot tonight. Um, but because they hadn't anticipated it, some backroom deals that were made between leaders of the former ruling party in the South and the former ruling party in the North, some backroom deals were kind of put in jeopardy by the emergence of this new third party. Not surprisingly, the Yemeni Socialist Party, which had ruled the Marxist South and now was the third place political party, didn't adjust to the new reality very well. Uh, and in 1994, there was a short civil war. And I say here that the civil war was between poorly integrated militaries because when the two countries unified, they didn't unify their military, at least not in the initial stages. And so that actually is part of what facilitated the ability to have a civil war. Um, after 1994, that changed. The southern military was pretty much destroyed. The northern military was hegemonic. And from 1994 on, well, from 1994 till at least 1997, let's say, the Islamists and the northern former ruling party, which is known as the General People's Congress, I don't think I have that anywhere in my slides. I'll call it the GPC. They're the rulers of the north. And the YSP, or the Yemeni Socialist Party, rulers of the South, and Islah is this large new Islamist party. So what happened from 1994 till in about 1997 is that the GPC and Islah essentially governed in coalition, while most of the leaders of the Yemeni Socialist Party were driven into exile owing to the fact that they had participated in the secessionist civil war. Southern cities that were really badly damaged during the civil war weren't rebuilt, and they got northern governors to come in and administer top-down policymaking. Um, if for those of you who are familiar with American history, uh, it bears some resemblance to the history of Reconstruction in the United States, and it certainly is experienced that way by southerners. By 1997, this is something I'll talk about more in a little bit, Islah realized that it might have been actually kind of, it might have played an important role in driving the YSP out through this kind of competitive calculus, but now that the YSP was out, they were the targets of regime repression. And so they started complaining about regime corruption, 
by the ruling by the General People's Congress and started resigning from positions in government ministries and becoming gradually over time a little bit more of an opposition bloc. But they were an imperfect opposition. In 1999, President Saleh ran for direct election for the first time. And it's not worth going into the way he had been elected before. But uh, they, they, he was directly elected for the first time, and the Islah Party backed him rather than run their own candidate. So they were, uh, they're often characterized as having been bought off with some uh, policy compromises at that point. But yeah, that's really the marker of regime consolidation, this competitive authoritarian regime. That's the time when a lot of the wiggle room in the Yemeni political system really disappeared and the system narrowed. By 2002, you have the formation of what's called the Joint Meeting Parties Opposition Coalition. And those are the guys, and ladies, definitely, uh, who are, have been really essential to laying the, the groundwork for the revolutionary movement. Now, I say 2002 to 2005, and it's weird to suggest that something like an opposition alliance might not have a clear starting date. Right? And 2005 would be its clear starting date when it issued a manifesto under the name of Joint Meeting Parties Coalition. But it began earlier through a series of very informal networks and connections among party leaders in the Yemeni Socialist Party and the Islamist Islam. Now, that came as a big surprise to people because they had been at each other's throats in the 1990s. And in fact, critics of Islam claim that Islahi clerics had sort of proliferated a discourse of takfir or allegations that socialists were apostates or improper Muslims uh, in ways that had facilitated some of the violence of the Civil War. And I think that that's a, a valid critique. And Islahi clerics were, I think, guilty of that. Consequently, it's that much more surprising that these two rival groups come into alliance together. And that's why I think it's important to note that that was built on the personal connections, that the personal connections between particularly a man named Mohammed Qahtan and a man named Jarela Omar from the two different parties, they were able to do what their parties as parties couldn't quite do. And so it was built over time. In 2006, we have what's typically considered the first JMP victory, and by some people, the last JMP victory. I put victory in scare quotes. There was a presidential election, and it was much, much more contested than it was in 1999, so that's a victory. The president had to work much harder to rig it. He had to pay a lot more money. Uh, and it's tragic in many ways that in 2009, when I was uh, doing interviews, people were still talking about 2006 as their big victory because they really were scrambling to keep their heads above water as an opposition and really not terribly effective in the years after that. By 2009, in fact, we see the, uh, the clearest example of that is the cancellation of the parliamentary elections that were scheduled for April of that year. So that's the first interruption in Yemen's electoral cycle from its establishment in 1990 until 2009. But they were canceled basically because there was a deadlock over electoral reform, because the parties couldn't agree on how to reform the electoral system. The ruling party didn't want to go to elections with a boycott from the opposition, because they thought that that would make it look like an authoritarian regime. Shock. Um, on the other side of the coin, the opposition didn't want to go forward with the kind of electoral law that was going to privilege the ruling party. So both sides sort of reached an agreement to postpone the election and enter into really sustained negotiations about how to reform the electoral law. And in, since, since then, things have moved well past the point of elections. I think it's safe to say. Um, okay. By two, um, I want to talk just a little bit about various other aspects of opposition in Yemen. Because the JMP is absolutely central, and I'm going to be talking about it a lot. But there are other prongs of opposition in Yemen. So there's this vibrant cross-ideological alliance of opposition parties. So the big parties in the JMP are the socialists and the Islamists, and the Islamists are much, much bigger in terms of their voter share. Uh, but the socialists continue to be very important in the South, in particular. Um, there are smaller leftist nationalist parties like the Nasserists and the Ba'athists, for those of you who are familiar with those, party, those parties kind of regionally. Uh, and there are some smaller religious nationalist parties that are attached to the Zaidi 
community as well. So it's it's a basket of parties, but it's really the YSP and Islah for the most part. In addition, there are groups that are engaging in armed uprising against the state and have been for some time. So the first is the Al Houthi rebellion in northern Saada province, which began around 2004 and essentially continues. There have been a series of ceasefires, but it's been uh, in entirely devastating to the northern province of Saada and displaced many tens of thousands of people. And a southern, something called the Southern Movement in the South in Aden and Abyan and Lahij. These are southern provinces of the former South, which began in 2007. And it began as a civil protest movement, not unlike what we see today. It was smaller in scale, but it was still, at the time, very dramatic. Nobody else outside of Yemen was paying much attention, but Ali Abdullah Saleh was paying attention. And he moved on the crowds with tanks and, uh, and artillery and, and killed civil protesters. They, some of them continued as civil protesters, and some of them took up arms. So it sort of splintered the southern movement uh, in, in a decisive way. So all of these groups have overlapping but not identical grievances. They've all had it up to here with the Saleh regime, and they've all come together in the current revolutionary movement in one way or another. Um, but the regime strategy over the past, since at least 2002, when the JMP first comes on the scene, the, the regime strategy has been one of division, surveillance, suppression, co-optation, classic strategies of authoritarian rule, but principally aimed to undermine collective action by all of these groups. That's a strategy that has not succeeded in the sense that we have an eight-month revolutionary movement, but one that has made the work of the revolutionaries much harder. So the questions that I really want to address is how did Islah come to dominate the politics of the JMP? So lots of critics of Islah will say that the JMP is just a front for Islah. I don't think it's just that. But I do think that Islah has left a very clear mark on the politics of organized opposition for a decade. And so that's going to have an influence on the revolutionary movement as well. How did Islahi women and women more generally come to play such an essential role in organizing the revolutionary movement? It's astounding in a country where the human development indicators for women are terribly, terribly low, much lower than anywhere else in the Arab region, that Arab women, that Yemeni women are front and center in organizing and in facilitating this revolutionary movement. And what is this doing to complicate the way we think about the relationship between gender opposition and Islamism. The scholarly literature on Islamist activism tends to regard Islamist activism as a threat to women's rights and interests. And this is problematic for a couple of reasons. It's problematic because Islamists aren't just one thing, right? Islamists are a reasonably very, come in a, a wide variety of shades and a wide variety of interests with regard to citizen rights and gender rights. And their organizational contexts differ tremendously, too. What they're actually able to do and what their relationship is with the state and, and, and those apparatuses of the state that guarantee and protect rights. So there's no particular reason to assume that the rise of Islamist politics is going to have a single uniform outcome on women's rights. But it's also problematic because there are a lot of women who are Islamists. And so assuming a priori that that contradicts women's rights makes it really difficult for us to make sense of why women engage in Islamist activism. And so Tawakal Kerman, you've been told this week by the media that Tawakal Kerman won the Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of her work for women's rights. And I would tell you that that came as a shock to me because I have always understood her primarily as an Islamist. So I want to help disentangle this a little bit. It underestimates the extent to which, this scholarly approach underestimates the extent to which women, like men, have multiple overlapping simultaneous identities that sometimes pull them in divergent ways, right? And we kind of tend to take this multiplicity for granted more with men than we do with women. And I think tend to take an, un, un, an inappropriately reductive approach to women's interests as gender-based primarily. So, there's this expression, anaka muslima, and I'm going to talk about it in just a second. For those of you who speak Arabic, you know that this is hard to translate, actually. You could choose to translate this as I as a Muslim, but then you'd be leaving out the fact that it actually says clearly I as a Muslim woman. 
right? It's a gendered expression. And Islamist women use it, to, it many times to introduce their activism. Like in an interview with an Islamist woman, she might begin by saying, Anna ka Muslima, I as a Muslim woman do this because. Privileging the interpretation of that as Islamist or, or as Muslim or as female is problematic. The Islamist Islah Party has been more successful in mobilizing women as voters and as activists than all other Yemeni parties combined. They register more voters, they get more women involved in their charitable association, they are really good at mobilizing women, so they are able to speak to this Anaka Muslima concept in a way that exceeds currently our theoretical vocabulary. So it doesn't distinguish between I as a Muslim and I as a Muslim woman. And similarly, you could argue that when men say Anaka Muslim, it also carries a gendered connotation, but we don't tend to pause over that gendered connotation nearly so often. Islamist women's activism has to be viewed, I would argue, as co-equally Islamist activism and women's activism. If we can't disentangle it, then we shouldn't decide how to translate it necessarily. The Nobel Committee, in deciding to interpret Tawakal Kerman's activism as women's activism, took a stand on how to translate or interpret that statement by her, and that's a statement that she has made to me. So I know that, that this problematic is a feature of her own thinking about her work. So before we can talk about Islamist women, specifically I want to talk about a trajectory of institutional Islamization in Yemen over the time since 1990. So as I said before, from 1990 to 1997, more or less, Islamists were involved in some way in governing coalitions with the ruling party and with other, and also sometimes with socialists. Um, they used this to affect certain legal changes that had an effect on gender-based rights in education and, and through the judiciary in particular. For women from the South, that tended to constitute a setback. For women from the South, where the Marxist regime had inscribed a particular form of legal equality between men and women, not always in practice, but it was there in the letter, uh, then this constituted a reduction in their rights. For women from the North, though, Islamists actually were often viewed as expanding their rights because they were articulating the idea of women as rights-bearing subjects, women as people who have rights. They might not be rights that are the same as the rights that men have, but they have rights, and that was actually a novel concept for many in the North at that time. Islah played a role um, during this time, as I suggested, in also outside of the institutional framework of governance. They played a role in proliferating takfir in ways that may have encouraged violence against socialists in particular. And that comes back into the story in a few minutes. Um, in the 1997 elections, the Yemeni Socialist Party decided that the game was so sufficiently rigged that they boycotted. And that was really one of those things that allowed the regime to further consolidate its control and led Islah actually to realize that it had now become obsolete. It was a useful weapon against the socialists, but now the regime was turning on Islah. Um, and that was when they complained more openly about corruption and gradually started resigning, as I suggested before. But by the time Islah and the YSP came into coalition with one another, trust was very low. That history of takfir, or those allegations of apostasy, left a real mark. Socialists felt intimidated. Socialists spoke to me in interviews frequently about not feeling able to articulate the full spectrum of their political positions when they were in mixed contexts, etc. It had essentially a self-censoring effect on many in the political left. There, a very, very different group of Islahis came into leadership positions within the party around the turn of the century. I don't know what century, we, uh, you know, the, the 2000s, right? What do we call that decade? I don't know. Um, it's a very different group of Islahis. They're much more centrist. They are deeply committed to this opposition alliance, but they also, like, kind of benefited from that earlier intimidation because the socialists that they came into alliance with were intimidated socialists. And so in that sense, there was like the legacy of what had happened in the 1990s. The YSP has not pressed for all of its objectives in this alliance because it understands that it's the junior partner and it understands at least to some extent the risks that that could entail. The JMP has therefore tended to advance policies that 
are pretty consistent with Islah's priorities, Islah itself has been changing, and women are a part of that story. But at the sort of alliance level, the politics of gender have been particularly silent. What the appropriate role for women in Yemeni political life ought to be is a divisive issue among the opposition parties. And because of that, and because of the necessity of a collective opposition, they just don't talk about women's issues very much. They certainly don't talk about it as a formal joint policy because they can't agree on that policy. So the socialists might say something about their policy and the Islamists might say something about their policy, but the JMP doesn't have much of a policy on gender. So the Islamization of institutions in the 1990s profoundly shaped the landscape of women's partisan political affiliation, the kinds of opportunities for women within political parties. As the parties came together into an alliance, what we see is that gen those parties that had gender-segmented opportunities for women, so a women's bureau like you have in the Islam party, um, helped Islamist women to more effectively craft the national gender agenda. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about what the national gender agenda has, has come to be, but they've managed to basically create a cadre of very accomplished female politicians by giving them opportunities through parallel institutions within the party. Whereas socialist women in a party that is formally committed to gender equality have had far, far fewer opportunities to develop their leadership capacity. By the way, that's not a Yemen story. That's a story about Islamist parties and segmented institutions. I'm a graduate of Smith College. It is a gender segmented institution, right? It's only for women. And I think it's really noteworthy that the traditional women's colleges have produced a disproportionate number of national level, uh, national level figures. Not that I'm one, but you know, you got my point. So the, an interesting follow-up to this is that on the one hand, these segmented institutions let Islahi women develop the capacity to set this gender agenda, and I'll unpack that in a minute, but they were so successful at doing that that they then were able to turn back to the party and say, and now you need to give us more power. And so to renegotiate the terms of the segmentation that empowered them in the first place. Uh, and I think that has something to do with how Tawakal Kerman comes to be on the front lines of the revolutionary movement. One thing that we see across this time period is that in each electoral cycle, the number of women candidates running for office and winning seats has consistently declined. It was never big, right? We're talking about going from four seats for women to two seats for women to no seats for women. So it's, you know, it's really um, been a consistent and sharp decline, and that's across the ideological spectrum. That means the Yemeni Socialist Party is not have either not fielding candidates in districts where they don't think that women can win or not. What most socialist women actually really complain about is that they don't get the kind of campaign funding that male candidates get. They don't get the kind of backing from the party that they're promised. Um, and one of the reasons that, an, another thing that they complain about is that the YSP has explicitly required them to campaign on a platform of workers' rights and prohibited them from speaking about women's rights. Well, Islahi women can talk about women's rights, women's delimited rights, but nonetheless, they can talk, they can have that conversation within these parallel institutions, but socialist women are constrained by their parties in ways that the, in ways that are different from the constraints on Islamist women. Um, what we see is that there has been a pretty substantial shift towards the associational sector. What do I mean by associational sector? NGOs and the media and basically ways of organizing outside of parties and outside of the state. And there's been a massive movement of women from partisan positions into the associational sector that's gone along with this decline. So you can see talented, engaged women shifting their focus, shifting their direction. In the face of these kinds of partisan disappointments, women redirected their efforts and it's had an effect. So in 1996, there were 375 registered civil society organizations in Yemen, and 14 of them were dedicated to women's issues. But all of them defined women's issues through the lens of the biological role of women as mothers, and focused on healthcare education, healthcare and education for mothers, and poverty alleviation for families. 
So that was the prevailing understanding of women's rights. Also, several of them had men as their board of directors. I don't remember how many. <laughs> so by 2005, so like a decade later, there were only 209 civil society organizations because there'd been a general restriction of the political space. 41 of them, so a much higher percentage, were women's organizations. The overwhelming majority were chaired by women. And they had redirected the focus to women's political rights, economic empowerment, and understanding women's rights as human rights. So there had been both a quantitative shift and a qualitative shift in women's engagement in the nonpartisan, non-state sector. Women's rights have broadly been taken up by women and men as part of a rights agenda that I think is feeding the revolutionary movement. So contra these, the impression that like it started in Tunisia and it spread across the region, yeah, it did a little bit, but these grievances are long standing, and so are the organizations on the backs of which they've been built. So we talk about the youth, but I'm really interested in the 30 year olds who have been doing this for 10 years or since they were college students, etc. So I mentioned that in this trajectory, Islahi women played an important role in transforming the gender agenda. So I want to flesh that out a little bit. There, were pers there are persistent gender gaps in development in Yemen, and international aid organizations really wanted to energize partisan women. They really wanted to get the women in the political parties. They wanted to use existing pluralist structures in Yemen to get women's voices to weigh in on what should be done. And they wanted it to be not opposition versus state. They wanted the, the GPC, the YSP, and Islah to all come to the table together and articulate a common agenda. The Islah's parallel institutions gave Islahi women an advantage. And this basically owes to that history of segmented public activism that I described. And it finds its expression, oops, it finds its expression in something called the Tripartite Declaration of 2004, which is exactly as it sounds. It's a declaration made by women from the three parties. And I have done a pretty close reading of this text in the context of my research and talked with a lot of people about it and its formation in, in interviews. And what you see is that, first and foremost, it expresses the objectives of the opposition. It's about procedural reform. It's about more democracy. It's about democracy as a path to women's rights, not statist women's rights, where the state expands rights in a kind of a decision-making vacuum. Um, so even though ruling party women were there, democracy and the procedural reform agenda were clearly affirmed. But it also recognizes women's roles as wives and mothers for, and roots their rights in those roles. And there is no reference in the document to, to legal equality between men and women. So the objectives of the Yemeni Socialist Party and of many women in the ruling party, which is not really leftist or conservative in any particular way, doesn't really have much of an ideology, but the objectives of many GPC and YSP women are silent in that document. So what we see, the outcomes of the negotiations show the relevance of opposition, but also the dominance of Islam within the JMP. So uh, it's an it's a very interesting document in that regard, and it's the one that went then back to the international donor community as the foundation for what donor aid would address. The success of Islahi women in that setting to help to transform Islah. So Islahi's women's success in framing this became a point of leverage for them with senior party leadership, and we see the clear effect of that in the 2007 internal elections. So the party holds internal elections every four years, a big party congress. All the registered members of the party get to vote. There are about 5,000 uh, voting eligible voting members at this 2007 conference from all different parts of the country. Islah, unlike the other parties, has a genuinely national presence. It's not really, it's a little bit more northern, but it has success in the south as well. So there were delegates from north and south. And what we see is that most of the conservative leaders were voted off of the Shura Council, and chief among them was Sheikh Abdul Majid al Zindani, who is a remarkably conservative um, member of the alliance, who really, quite frankly, is not down with the JMP at all, and has very close ties to Ali Abdullah Saleh. Uh, when I talk with Islahis about why they don't just kick him out of the party, given that he's constantly kind of going behind their back to the president, 
Uh, they always said, well, if we do that, then the ruling party will snap him up and all his support. Uh, so there's sort of a pragmatic reason. But he was voted off. And one of the reasons he was voted off is because he said that women shouldn't be able to stand as candidates for the Shura Council. And so he lost the election by campaigning against women and their increased inclusion. Thirteen women were elected to the council, including Tawafel Kerman. And of them, Amata Salem Raja, who is the head of that parallel women's directorate, she's sort of the top-ranking Islahi uh, female politician, had the tenth largest voter share of 130 delegates. Right, So 120 people were less popular than she was among the 5,000 voting members, most of whom were men. So it was a, a way in which men affirmed Male Islamists affirmed the value of female Islamists to the party as an institution and ceded some decision-making authority to them. And what we see now is that there are more women in decision-making positions within the Islah party than in any other party in Yemen. So this is like the big success story for Islamist women. It's also had effects on the opposition in transitioning from opposition to revolution. So... Well before 2011, women were essential to opposition politics, and this largely owes to their movement into the associational sector. Um, one thing that happened coming out of that 2007 election is that the is Sheikh Sindani, when he was voted off the council, formed an organization called the Fadila Group. If you want to think of the JMP as one kind of alliance, the Fadila Group is another kind of alliance. It's an alliance of conservative clerics, with ties to the ruling party and to the conservative wing of Islah that proliferated takfiri kinds of documents calling for uh, limitations on women's rights, limitations on press freedoms, limitations on uh, creedal freedoms, like the ability to not believe, for example. Uh, so a very kind of reactionary agenda that was a direct response to him getting voted out of a leadership position. He basically kind of went on the warpath there. This means that the Islah leadership was torn between the pro-JMP group and the pro-Fadila group. And most of the women activists in the directorate went in the direction of the JMP and really dug their heels in with the opposition. This also helped to forge closer bonds with women in other parties within the JMP and helped to kind of sediment the alliance as a whole. But there also were ties to women who were working in the associational sector. And I think that's when this really becomes important for the revolution. One of the things that we see is that there's a, oops, that's not what I meant to, to necessarily have. There's a triangular relationship um, between the regime, the partisan opposition, and the associational sector. So when the regime goes after NGOs, for example, and the media, and cracks down on them, the parties will come to their defense. And when the regime goes after the parties, the media and the NGOs will come to their defense. So the networks that Islahi women and other women in the partisan sector maintained with women in the associational sector who used to be in the parties with them, you know, who went to college with them, who went through a lot of the same kinds of life experiences together, have been really central to that ability to do that triangulation. Now, that triangulation means that certainly the Yemeni opposition didn't succeed in achieving its objectives before the development of a revolutionary movement, but it didn't get stamped out either. And that's actually saying something. To sustain 10 years of organized political opposition, um, leading up to the revolution is a big deal. After years of policy silence by the JMP on the issue of women, the expanding political role of women is part of the agenda of the revolution. It's not clear what rights women are interested in pursuing coming out of the revolution because Yemeni women aren't all of one mind, right? And, and I think that's one of the important and instructive stories of these past 20 years. What is clear is that nobody is going to put up with the kind of um, instrumental silence that characterized the organized opposition before the revolution. And Tawafo Kerman winning the prize really, I think, makes it even more impossible that that kind of silence could occur. The combined effects of Islamist institutional reform in the 90s and the dynamics of the JMP alliance itself have made it difficult for women activists to expand the role of women's rights um, in terms of legal equality in particular. But Islahi women have been really central to advancing the broader 
re procedural reform agenda, the push for democracy, and the hope that democracy is actually the avenue towards greater, greater and more plural conceptions, potentially, of women's rights. This has given them credibility and power within their party and within the JMP alliance itself. And because of their links to associational sector activists, it's helped to put them at the forefront of the civil revolutionary movement. So basically, the upshot is success in the segmented public sphere has led to a larger role in a gender-integrated public sphere. So what about Tawakal Kerman? She's basically an illustration of the shifting kinds of opportunities and incentives that Yemeni women have faced. Uh, as citizens, as women, and as Islamists. She's a perfect embodiment of the inability to disentangle this concept of Anaka Muslima. She's also a multivalent symbol of the revolution, and I want to say that she means something very different to different constituencies in Yemen right now, and in the international community. To the Nobel Committee, what does she mean? And the international media, perhaps. She represents women's rights in a pr profoundly patriarchal context. I personally find that interpretation to be really reductive and to flatten the complexity of her worldview. So I encourage you to think skeptically about accounts that follow that basic narrative. To many Yemenis, though, with it, uh, to many Yemeni opposition activists, she represents the looming possibility of Islam's dominance in a post-revolutionary context. She certainly symbolizes Islam's dominance over the past 20, or ascendant dominance over the past 20 years, and people worry about, you may hear the expression, that the Islamists are hijacking the revolution. I don't like the militancy of that expression, uh, and I also don't totally think that it's true. But that fear, that anxiety certainly exists among leftists and other secular actors within the opposition. To conservative Islamis like Sheikh Zindani, she represents the ascendance of the JMP centrists that have elbowed them out of the mainstream of the political spectrum. To the JMP centrists in the Islam party, in the Islamist coalition, the people that committed Democrats within the opposition, she represents a clear victory, and they claim her as one of their own, and they don't say she's a woman one of us, they say she's a one of us. Well, okay, it's a gendered language, so they actually do say she's a woman, one of us, but they don't emphasize that. And to the hundreds of thousands of people who've been holding her picture, hundreds of thousands of Yemeni men, it, again, in a profoundly patriarchal context, who've been holding up her picture since January as they show up day after day, unarmed, for civil protests at which they will be shot at and repressed, she is a constant reaffirmation of the potential of the revolutionary movement. That's it. So because I changed what I was going to talk about to focus a little bit more on the gender component, I didn't do nuts and bolts of the revolution, but I'm happy to talk about it and prepare to answer your questions about it. Sure. I'm called Tom Google. And Professor Google kind of has, has agreed to answer questions even before I asked her if she would agree. Oh. So she agrees to answer questions. So <laughs> if you have anything, raise your hand. I'll call on you. And... Yes, Professor Grobart. Uh, very interesting talk. Uh, thank you for your invitation to expand on the nuts and bolts. Could you say something about? The socio-economic issues, and particularly the economic issues that divide these various groups, and maybe their divisions within the Islamists, and maybe also something about distinct foreign policy positions, like toward um, the U.S., toward Israel, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and so forth. Sure. Um, okay. The socio-economic question: um, Yemen's economy is. Uh, worse than stagnant, right? It's been declining consistently. Um, it has, for example, the highest fertility rate in the region, um, and dramatically declining water reserves, as you may be aware. Um, most people have to buy water privately, uh, and a lot of people can't, so access to basic sanitation is limited. Um, the there's, with such a high fertility rate, a huge 
youth population um, and very little expectation of realistic expectation of employment. So these are all kind of characteristics of these are common characteristics across the region, but they're almost always more pronounced in Yemen. Yemen is almost always coming out worst on these indicators. Women's literacy, for example, uh, is below 50 percent. So, so th that's sort of that terrain. Um, and what's the deal with the oil? Um, they have a little bit. That little bit is totally central to Yemen and reasonably insignificant to the rest of us. So in terms of global production, it's a tiny drop in the bucket, but it's over 70% of the government's revenues. And it's probably, it's already reached the point where they're importing to meet their domestic need uh, it, because of um, some allocation problems. So that, that would be my general picture of a bleak economy. Um, but are there regional divisions? Yes. First of all, in the north, maybe I need my map back. Um, in the north, oh, that's going to be tedious. OK. In the northern region of Saada, up here on the Saudi border, where there's been since 2004 armed insurgency, there are massive displaced people, um, the destruction of civilian infrastructure, which was never strong to begin with there, and, a, and constant endemic conflict. Now we can say in the south, the south wasn't rebuilt after the Civil War. So um, the destruction of infrastructure that occurred there under war wasn't reestablished. And so those populations are particularly hard hit, but out here, there's not a lot of population concentration out here. This is desert, basically. Um, but those populations are also grossly neglected and poorly integrated into the rest of the country. Ma majority of the populations in the highlands right in here. So um, Yemen is the only country in the Middle East where more of the population lives in rural areas than in urban areas, which makes the distribution of goods and services particularly challenging. Um, <clears throat> That doesn't appear to map on particularly to divisions within the Islamists or divisions within the opposition, except to say that the YSP is still sort of associated with the South. And so the neglect of the South is very important to the YSP, and it's sometimes been hard to get Islam to care very much about that because their constituencies tend to be more Northern. Um, but that hasn't been huge. On foreign policy, uh, nobody likes the drone strikes. They symbolize, first of all, they, they have killed a lot of Yemeni civilians. It, you know, there, there's a lot of what the defense establishment calls collateral damage and people in Yemen call the destruction of their homes and their families. So that's a disaster across the board. But it also signifies the fact that their president is willing to cede sovereignty over Yemeni territory to an external actor in exchange for what? In exchange for more military assistance, which is used to suppress the domestic opposition. So the foreign policy connection, I think that matters. Um, the Saudi relationship is really complicated, but the easiest version of it is Saudi would like to see basically the same thing that the United States government appears to want as well, which is a stable um, and presumably strong authoritarian regime uh, because it's workable. It's uh, that that appears to be, um, and there's a, a faction within the opposition that I didn't mention today because he's only become a part of the opposition in March. General Ali Mohsen, who brought the first armored division of the military with him to the protests to surround the protesters and physically protect them from the other branches of the military, um, he's positioning to be the new president, and he's been positioning for that for maybe ten years. So. He's, he's kind of, I, I think the opposition sees through that, but they need his protection. Um, yeah? Um, for the revolution to succeed, do you think the United States needs to give aid specifically to democracy assistance or aiding the women or with their literacy, would you say? Nope. Um, I don't think that democracy, assi d democracy building assistance is effective in the middle of a revolution. I, I think that what really needs to happen is the transfer of power. And when the transfer of power happens, then maybe there's more scope for um, outside organizations. But I tend to think that in Yemen, the organizations that have been the most effective have been the most focused on procedural reform and the least focused on outcome. 
So the National Democratic Institute is active in Yemen, but they tend to be pretty focused on outcome, on making sure that democratic practices or policies produce the right winners. Whereas the International Federation of Electoral Studies is more neutrally focused on decision-making mechanisms and less invested in producing particular outcomes. So, you know, I tend to think that it should be handled more through international organizations and less through bilateral government assistance. The, the organizations that I think have done the best work there, again, IFIS, the United Nations Development Program, um, NDI has been a lightning rod and it's seen as an extension of the American government and so that's polarizing. I don't think that they chose her I don't think the Nobel Committee chose her because of what she symbolizes in terms of Islam I'm not sure that they I mean I don't mean to be glib I'm sure they did know she was a member of the Islam party but lots of the coverage of her including a prominent member of the Council on Foreign Relations uh, have published um, amazingly egregious accounts of her political biography, focusing almost exclusively on an NGO that she founded, Arab journalists without, or Arab women journalists without chains. Now that's a rights organization. It's not a women's rights organization explicitly. They've been really active in backing up male journalists who've faced regime suppression, but it tends to a lot of organizations in Yemen tend to be gender segmented. It's a pretty segmented society in public life. And so it's not that surprising to find NGOs that tend to be organized by women and NGOs that tend to be more organized by men. So, you know, I don't see or read her organization as being particularly women's rightsy. And so I don't understand that the particular decision to single her out for that, except to the extent if I'm having a very cynical day to say that it blunts her political message at a moment when a lot of people in the international community are really ambivalent about the idea of regime change in Yemen. We have a friendly dictator there who's willing to let us fly drone strikes and commit counterinsurgency operations, and we've invested a lot, and this administration in the United States has particularly invested more than any other, uh, dramatically increasing military assistance and counterterrorism. You know what counterterrorism entails is a lot of surveillance, right? Like that's what a lot of actual counterterrorism operations is. It's listening in and trying to identify threats. Well, the, it's a really narrow line between listening in to find out who's a threat in terms of terrorism and listening in to find out who's a threat to your regime. So it's, it's what we call a fungible resource in that sense. And uh, so I, I think um, that's my cynical answer. And because I don't know anybody on the Nobel Committee, I don't, you know, I don't really know why they chose her, but I'm really dissatisfied with what I see as the disservice that's being done to the complexity of what she's about. Right, right. So, one of the things I didn't mention is that Tawakal Kerman has been organizing protests against government corruption since 2007 every Tuesday. So every Tuesday in front of the Department of, or the Ministry of Justice calling for inquiries into corruption, calling for increased government transparency. Well, increased government transparency and reduced corruption is a cross-ideological objective. That's not an, uh, an Islamist objective. It's not a socialist objective. It's a good governance objective. And so I think that's a big part of why is that she is tenacious and she's understood that way. She also does all kinds of social things right. She's a mom. She's married. She's frequently seen with her kids. So all this stuff she does, it doesn't take away from her the primary responsibilities that she has in the eyes of, of social conservatives. So I think all of that kind of comes together. And then for women's rights activists, she's a little controversial because on the one hand, they see her advancing Islahi priorities that might not fit with secular women women's activist objectives. But on the other hand, she's a really competent woman who's taking on the system. And so, you know, I think it's 
she is really just genuinely multivalent and able to talk to a lot of constituencies. She also has amazing charisma. Uh, I watched her first interview in Change Square live as it was happening um, on Friday, and it absolutely gave me chills, teared up a little. She is an amazing speaker, and she has never been afraid to grab a microphone and stand up in front of a crowd and just get going. I think that's a spectacular basket of questions that I'm really happy to address. Um, on the first part, uh, was she recognized for women's rights or human rights? She was recognized for women's rights. Uh, she was recognized alongside two other women. They have to share it. Um, and the other two women are Liberian women, also active in the women's rights agenda. And so that was what they chose to focus on. And as I said, I think it's problematic. I would interpret her as a civil rights activist. Um, and the, there are implications for women when you have civil rights. So the effect of the, the achievement of the objectives that Tawakal is, is focusing on, achieving those would, would definitely expand women's rights. Um, but I'm, I think she's looking to expand rights for everybody, uh, in that way. What does this, the role of women in the Yemeni revolution um, do for our conceptions about women's agency. I think it's really important. It's why I chose to retool the talk a little bit and focus more on the gender side of things. This idea that women have lots of different identities that pull them in lots of different directions is something that it's essential for us to recognize at home, abroad, across the board. Right? I don't think one can viably be a feminist and still focus only on gender-based identity. Um, so, so that's, that's my initial answer there. But also, yeah, of course, if it can happen in Yemen like this, I imagine it's also happening elsewhere in the region. Uh, I know it's happening elsewhere in the region that women are playing an absolutely vital role in these movements. So, um, there was a great grassroots effort through Facebook during the Egyptian revolution to put up all the pictures of women at the protests that weren't making it onto the front page of the New York Times. You know, and it's a wonderful, I actually, it's a public album, so I encourage you to search for it. Just, I think if you just do Women of Egypt. And it'll give you some sense of what was happening, but not necessarily being documented as visibly because it didn't fit with particular narratives. The question down there, too. Oh. Okay. I know we're talking to you about Yemen, but I'm wondering about the female movement that's happening in Saudi Arabia. Do you think that um, what's happening in the Yemen is different than what's happening in Saudi Arabia? Because you're by the same reputation. Yeah. Uh, and the social ties between Yemen and, and Saudi Arabia are also very deep, right? There's, there, are, uh, there are a lot of common social habits and customs. There's a lot of labor migration that has brought Yemenis and Saudis into constant contact with one another. Uh, it, it, the border was only demarcated in 2000, right? So uh, it's a good question. And, you know, for those of you who don't know, Saudi women have been actively engaged in protest activity this year along a clear gender dimension, calling specifically for the right to drive, 
as a symbol of a lot of other things, right? And they've been denied it because the right to drive is a symbol of a lot of other things. And so, you know, I don't think anybody actually really cares about the driving itself. I think it's always what the driving both enables and signifies. Uh, as my, my husband was a professor at the American University in Cairo, um, and he had a Saudi research assistant. I had a conversation with him about this, and he said, well, we can't give them the right to drive. Why? And he said, it's a slippery slope. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, the king is to Saudi society as the husband is to the family. And if you give in to the demand at the political level, women are going to think they can start demanding things from their husbands. And I mean, I have no idea whether or not that's a representative view, but I think I, I have actually read enough to suggest that it's very much about not giving women the right to drive because they ask. Right? Not, not because they shouldn't have it, but because they asked. And the slippery slope that granting women's demands would actually constitute. I think in many ways, Saudi women are far more inhibited than Yemeni women in everyday life. Um, part of that owes to the economic circumstances. Uh, Yemeni women don't have the luxury, in many cases, of not working. Uh, and especially in the, the, the lower working classes. And so they are more visible in that sense. Um, a part of it owes to the plural history with the South and Southern women doing things a little bit differently. Uh, and Yemenis will say that part of it owes to the fundamental character of the Yemeni spirit. I don't, I don't know about that one either. Um, but I think this should have an effect. And another reason I think it should have an effect is that, and nobody likes to talk about this too much, but there are clear hierarchies within the Arab region, and Yemen is the butt of a lot of jokes. They're seen as the mutakhalifin, the backward bumpkins from the nether regions, right? You don't want to do what the Yemenis do. Uh, and so if, if the Yemenis can do this, then I think Saudi women are going to say, well, if even Yemenis can do this, then surely we can do this too. Um, and I, I've already heard a lot of jokes like that. So, does that answer? Myself. Um, maybe I'd like to take you back to the original talk you had intended to give. Yeah. And maybe you can tell us a little bit more about who are these young people on the street? How did they get to be on the street? Sort of, you've told us about the long standing level of organization mm -hmm. that supports them, but at some point, the, um, that uh, inspiration from the Tunisia and Egypt yep. is real as well. So maybe you could tell us something about those people on the street right now, the university students, etc. So how, they, how did they come about to do that? Basically what happened in January was that the JMP was organizing protests. And particularly after the Tunisian spark, let's say, they organized some protests calling not for the fall of the regime, but for the procedural reform agenda that they were always going after. And then they, the regime said, okay, we'll go into negotiations over this. And the youth said, we came out to the protests, but we aren't ready to leave yet. And we don't want to go into more elite level negotiations by opposition parties that have become increasingly alienated from their grassroots. So I think it was really, it was a critique of the leadership of the organized opposition as much as anything else. And that's a critique that's continued throughout the movement. It corrected itself. By February, the opposition got on board and was down at the protests, too. But a lot of people like Tawakul Kerman and, and these other sort of mid-level activists were always there. So this is the mischaracterization of the term youth, is that it suggests particularly young people, right? Uh, and in fact, there are plenty of 30- and 40-year-old activists who ne aren't at the senior level in the parties who have been maintaining a lot of the networks in the protests. So there's what I call a demographic youth in terms of young people, and then a sort of social youth of people who are kind of forward-looking um, involved in this movement. So what we've got then is we have the JMP and the youth, and they constitute the civil opposition. These are the people who are not using weapons, who are showing up and getting shot at, but not using weapons, who have camped out, particularly the youth, who have camped out in Change Square in Sana'a and in Ta'iz in tents for eight months. Right? It's amazing. And they've got generators down at the tents so they can get online and all that. Bear in mind, literacy rates are low, inter internet penetration is not high, so the Facebooking and the tweeting that we saw in Egypt has been, is much smaller scale in Yemen, but still also very useful. There are a lot of good tweeters. Um, and then March 18th, 
The regime sent on, uh, plain clothes guys up onto the roof of buildings around Times Square and they fired into this crowd and they killed, uh, you know, about 50 people. Um, and 48, I think. And it was a real, a massacre. And at that point, you got Ali Mohsen and the first armored division of the military forming part of a perimeter around the protesters and a prominent tribal leader from a very famous family, Sadiq al-Ahmar, whose father actually had been a member of Islah, um, whose brother is also a member of Islah, um, and they form this protective barrier around the protesters. So there is violence, absolutely. There's fighting going on between armed groups that is happening simultaneously with these hundreds of thousands of civil protesters. Uh, and the violence is largely initiated by the state and buffered by the these other groups. Now, one thing we see if we look at Egypt, when the army decides to side with the, keeping the state coherent but turning against the regime, going back to that distinction I drew at the beginning between state and regime, when the army decides to side with the people and keep the state intact and turn on the regime, it, the revolution succeeds, right? Um, and so one wonders here, what we, we don't see that here. What we see instead is the army is split. And some of it has gone with the protesters and some of it has gone, uh, stayed with Saleh, in particular the Republican guards. But when Saleh returned from Saudi Arabia, so he was attacked June 3rd, he had to go to Saudi Arabia for treatment. He's badly wounded. Uh, looks kind of weird. Um, it, very badly burned and not using one side of his body. Um, when he returned earlier in September, everyone freaked out, kind of, this, this was going to be the beginning of the end. In some ways, it might actually be the beginning of the end, because what happened is that 26th of September, which was a couple of days after he returned, is a major military anniversary in Yemen, and we all kind of knew that something symbolic would happen on that day, and I expected that the regime would use a lot of force, but what actually happened is that a large contingent of Republican guards from that group of the military loyal to Saleh defected to join the opposition. So now we can add some, not all, Republican guards. So it may be that the army is kind of moving to support the opposition in pieces in Yemen uh, rather than wholesale. It may also be that the revolution doesn't succeed. Sure. Um, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, right, also known as Aqwap, is prominent mostly in a couple of provinces of the south of Abiyan and Lahaj uh, in particular. And if, so, so along here, where there has been actually in Abiyan, there was, there's like a, some history of radicalism there. Um, the people who attacked the USS Cole were a part of uh, a militia from that region. Those are the places where they're most active, but there are a couple tribal regions further to the north. AQAP does not aspire in any way to govern Yemen. Al-Qaeda did not aspire, for example, to govern Afghanistan. They wanted to take advantage of safe haven in Afghanistan, right? That's why we can say that the Taliban and Al-Qaeda are not the same thing. Um, similarly, Al-Qaeda wants safe haven in Yemen, and the chaos of the current protracted crisis has provided that. There really isn't any force that's capable of monopolizing violence in the way that we expect state, uh, central, centralized state authority to do. Um, violence is being enacted by non-state actors, by state actors, by the American actors, by Al-Qaeda, all at once, simultaneously. So um, certainly I don't think that the Yemeni regime at this moment has the resources to divert to wholesale, a, a, a wholesale kind of um, campaign against al-Qaeda. They're struggling for survival. Uh, and so the United States has been increasing its operations there. But it is really important to emphasize that al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula has no aspiration to govern Yemen. They have an aspiration to see Yemen either continue in chaos 
or be governed by a regime that would be friendly to them. But an Islamist government founded by or headed by Islah, first of all, I don't think Islah has the kind of national pull right now to actually lead any kind of new government. But they would be a factor in a new government. They're not the kind of Islamists who are going to be sympathetic to allowing Al Qaeda to operate there. Heavy connotation? Can you elaborate what you mean by that? Um, I mean, I, I think that the Western media coverage is pretty poor still, um, and I don't rely on it very much, and I encourage you all, because Al Jazeera English is completely accessible, there's even a smartphone application, uh, I encourage you to make more use of that. Like, you can think of the, of the first Gulf War actually as having made CNN a household name. I think that the Arab uprisings of 2011 are going to make Al Jazeera English a household name. Uh, and I, I hope for that because they're, they're doing much better coverage. In terms of Western coverage, you know, yeah, a lot more people in the U.S. know the names and locations of a lot more countries in the region right now. And that's a net good. Right? That's, that's a good thing. Um, but I don't think, as somebody who teaches comparative politics of the Middle East to undergrads, um, I don't think that the coverage is yielding substantially more nuanced views, uh, at this stage. I hope it will. Ali Mohsen? He's breaking chain of command. No, it's not the norm. He broke chain of command. He is a a rebel leader now. Um, he he just isn't very trusted by the opposition because they see him as look. If you go back to when I said that there was this Houthi rebellion in the north, Ali Mohsen was in charge of killing the Houthis, right? And everybody remembers that. So he was in charge of that campaign in Saada, and now the Houthis and Ali Mohsen are all part of the opposition because everyone shares this interest in getting rid of Saleh. But it's a short term objective. The durable alliances are here, right? People set up tents together and they live together and they wage the struggle for eight months together. They develop some lasting loyalties that probably transcend partisan affiliation. I talk about this as a kind of post-partisan opposition nationalism. If we think of nationalist projects as usually originating at the state level and being taught to people, right, through schools, and so this is a grassroots bottom-up form of nationalism that's coming from the populist struggle in the center core. What happens with Sadiq al-Ahmar, what happens with Ali Mohsen, what happens maybe with some of these Republican guards, is they all make a bid to control whatever comes next. And maybe they get some help, maybe they do that through negotiations with these guys, or maybe they do that with some outside assistance. It's not really clear, it's too soon to say. Uh, the first thing that we should stop doing is sending arms. That, that to me is completely clear. Beyond that, the transitional government, or the transitional agreements that are being circulated right now, two things are going on. First, there's this GCC initiative from the Gulf Cooperation Council, which is a really bad deal. It's, the opposition's not interested in it. They signed it under some duress. 
in the first few months of the of the revolution, and Saleh failed to show up to sign it three times uh, because he was really just not committed. That deal is problematic because what it grants him is legal immunity. Because one thing to bear in mind about the Arab uprisings is that the dictators are watching what happens from one country to the next. And so they look and they see Ben Ali from Tunisia is sitting in Saudi Arabia with a pot of money, and Mubarak is sitting in a jail cell on trial, and then, you know, so he's tried to negotiate legal immunity and a 30-day window to move his money out of the country and essentially to handpick some designated successors. So that's a bad deal, and, and I think the opposition is less favorably inclined to it today than they were in April. I think in April they hoped they could put a nice quick close to this, but there's a lot of killing under the bridge since then, and I think now they just they want him on trial. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, the Yemen file, as it's called, goes to the UN Security Council this week. And so um, we should anticipate a resolution. I'm not sure what the resolution is going to entail. There's been a lot of backroom discussions. Uh, it's possible there will be sanctions on the regime. Uh, it's unlikely that we would be that there would be any kind of UN authorized military engagement, nor do I think that that would be helpful. Um, so no, I don't think there's a lot the U.S. can do except stop the military assistance. Um, I will say that like Egypt, anti-American sentiment did not increase in Egypt when President Obama was late to recognize the revolution because Egyptians never expected him to recognize the revolution <laughs> because they always understood that the U.S. was friendly with the Mubarak regime. That's the same thing in Yemen. Right, so Yemenis are not expecting American white knights to come to their rescue at this point, but they would like for the U.S. to stop providing the mechanisms of, of military campaign. Yes. Yep. Arms, surveillance technology, uh, training. Yeah. Uh, Al Qaeda, and um, yeah, we're trying to be kind of rather quiet about it right now, to tell you the truth. But uh, we don't speak out on behalf of the Yemeni revolution either. Uh, so we're we're pretty quiet in our policy on Yemen, uh, in part because we've dramatically increased drone strikes there over the past couple of years, or, or the past couple of months rather. It's um, yeah, we're supplying the Saleh regime. I'm not certain. Uh, I can't say. I do think that the position that Yemeni activists are taking is that a speedy transition to a, a speedy end to the revolution. I mean, part of the reason I spent so much time on the organized opposition was to give you the impression that there is there there is a competent set of politicians waiting to govern this country. It's not a power vacuum situation. It's very clear that the next leadership of the country will come from somewhere in in, in or around this circle. Um, I hope that it'll be here. It might be here, but there are people, right? It's not, uh, it's not full of unknowns in that regard. And so they're saying the, the sooner the better, and then we can actually engage in cooperation on counterterrorism, but also be accountable to our population and be a decent government. You know, and I think that that's like, uh, they're, they're certainly not talking about, the opposition, for example, is not saying that they won't cooperate in counterterrorism and be an ally of the U.S. They would just like to be, Democratically accountable ally of the U.S. Yeah. It is almost laughable how unknown Anwar al-Awlaki was to Yemenis. He was relevant to al-Qaeda's ability to recruit in the West primarily because he was an English speaker, right, uh, and a U.S. citizen. Uh, but he was virtually irrelevant on the ground in, in Yemen and certainly um, was not playing a, a massive role in recruiting Yemenis to al-Qaeda. Uh, so there's, there was a lot of talk about that, actually, after he was killed. Yemenis were upset about the violation of Yemeni sovereignty, 
um, and certainly wished that he had been detained and tried instead of assassinated. But the it was sort of a Anwar who. Yeah, I mean, I think that Ali Mohsen will try. Um, but the truth is, I think if he tries without, without bringing these guys on board, without making some concessions to the JMP and to the youth, um, then he'll have to do it through force. And I think everyone's getting very tired of force, uh, very tired of force. So in that sense, his better strategy is to negotiate and make concessions to them, include them in some kind of new government, in which case we might end up with another competitive authoritarian regime, right, where there's some pluralism and some centralized executive authority. Uh, that's a possible outcome. Uh, what I don't see as possible is for the JMP and youth to succeed without making some concessions to Ali Mohsen because governments need armies, right? And so they need to have the army on board in order to be able to secure borders and govern and do some of the basic statecraft stuff. Um, so I think, you know, that conversation is going to happen. Sadiq al-Ahmar becomes a little bit more of a, a, a hinge player. We're not really sure what to do with him, but his brother is part of the JMP alliance presumably, and they have a little competition between them, but presumably that might help. I don't think it's either or, right? I mean, I think you can actually have both of those. But I, I absolutely expect two things. Going back to the media question, I certainly expect that we'll be paying more attention to what Yemeni women are doing. Uh, and therefore see some of what's already been going on. Because Yemeni women have been really active already. They just have been active among women mainly, whereas men have been active among men mainly. So I do think, though, that the leadership roles that women are playing in, in the revolution are going to let them push for a little bit more integration. I don't expect that integrated public activism is going to entirely do away with segmented public activism. Nor do I think that that's necessarily like a, a big deal, right? I, I, some, there's space for women's activism among women too. Um, so I, you know, what I also think though is that Carmen's award of the prize reinvigorated the negotiation process for a transfer of power, and it had reached quite a stalemate. And the progress towards the Security Council discussions uh, uh, really, I think, snowballed after uh, suddenly people are watching Yemen in a little bit more than they were. Uh, last week, even. So the rights that she's demanded are civil rights. They're not rights just for women. They're rights for women and men. They're rights for political accountability, rights for meaningful representation. And she's been very concrete about those. She has not stood up and said she wants. She has not stood up and said she wants. She has not stood up and said she wants. She has not stood up and said she wants. She has not stood up and said she wants. She has not stood up and said she wants. She has not stood up and said she wants. She has not stood up and said she wants. She has not stood up and said she.